Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. And I bet you're exposed to investment risk right now. To reduce it, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and download the risk reduction checklist I've made specifically for you, my podcast listeners, based on the lessons I have learned from all of my guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Sots from A Sots Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Shashank Radiv, Randiv, Shashank, are you ready to rock? Yes. <laughs> all right, but let me tell the audience a little bit about you. Shashank, brings entrepreneurial and investment understanding with 15 plus years of cross-functional expertise. He has acquired a depth and breadth of experience from working in large companies, being the founding member for a SaaS startup, which was acquired by a Fortune 500 company, to an early stage fund investing in technology-enabled startups. Shashank is founder VC at 100X. Dot VC, India's first venture fund to invest in early stage startups using iSafe notes. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up. Go to www.100x.vc and give it a try. Submit your high quality pitch deck there today. So, Shank, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Thanks, Andrew. It's an absolute pleasure uh, being on the podcast. Uh, I'm so delighted to reconnect with you. And, uh, you know, as asked by you, to fill in the specifics, I'd like to kind of, you know, um, you know, make an entry over here at this point of time for the audience that, you know, Andrew and myself got connected over a very, um, very uh, strange circumstance. We, we, we just started talking when we met for the first time and realized that uh, he stays in a building where I used to stay uh, during my school days in Bangkok, Thailand. And, and that's how this whole conversation journey started of me being connected to Andrew and following his great, um, uh, absolutely amazing work. Uh, and, so and I'd add to that. It was pretty funny because I was in uh, Mumbai, I believe it was, for an event. Yes. And, uh, and we started talking and you said, yeah, I used to live in Bangkok. And yeah. I said, well, where? He said, oh, on Sukhumit Road. <laughs> and I said, okay, what soy? And he yeah. said, soy 12. And I said, okay, and where on soy 12? Well, deep in the soy, you know, down the street, you know, you wouldn't know. I said, well, what building? And he said, Asia House. And I said, that's where I live. What floor? <laughs> so that's how it went. That was pretty amazing when we both like looked at each other like that. It's a small world. So yes. that's the story. Yeah. No, and, 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 you know, uh, it, it's been a fantastic journey from, from Thailand. I, I, I spent two years over there studying at, in, at the International School of Bangkok. I had some amazing experiences. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, then I moved back to India, did my engineering, worked with a few large corporates, um, did my MBA, and, and ended up becoming the founding member for a startup called VCC Edge, uh, which eventually got acquired by News Corporation, the holding company in New York, which was a fantastic journey, gave me, gave me a deeper understanding of the evolving ecosystem in India uh, when it came to venture capital and, prime, and, and private equity. Uh, and, and since the acquisition, I've been part of the ecosystem, making investments on the personal side, and, and now I've been again fortunate enough to join hands with my other partners at 100x.vc and, and fund early stage companies. Uh, our current portfolio size is of 39 companies, and we hope to reach a portfolio size of 80 uh, by end of this year. And I'm super excited about the time, even post COVID. Uh, I think it was a very humbling year for all of us, but I think it's, it's one of the best times for startup entrepreneurs and investors to kind of really, really uh, identify the next, next uh, unicorn, so to speak, uh, uh, because you know, the mindset and the consumer behaviors are really changing now. And mm. it's just a great time to be investing in this asset class. So, so the, that's a little more on uh, from my side, Andrew. Yeah, you know, in preparing for this discussion, I went to the website of 100x.vc and I downloaded 
some of the documents that are available there. And I think, you know, for anybody in India in particular who is interested in getting funding, you know, these documents are great. And I know that you guys are using the SAFE model, but you call it iSAFE for India. And it went through, you can look at some of the details here, but it's a, you know, a very interesting way, or let's say um, maybe better way of funding for both parties. Uh, it also seems to be a way to standardize the funding process a bit, you know, and I went through some of the clauses that kind of stood out was, you know, the, the obligations of reporting financial results on a regular basis. Also, it's interesting that you have the CEO or designated person sign a compliance to applicable laws, which is a very interesting thing. And it's actually a tool, I always say, for, uh, for people who, who are sometimes, you know, challenged with opportunities and people want them to break the law. And they, you can use this as a way of saying, my investors just won't let me do it. I've already signed that I won't do it. So that's powerful. And just going through all of the different, you know, events and stuff like that is very fascinating. But maybe it would be good before we get into the, the question of the day that you explain to people what is the iSafe sure. investment method compared to just a typical method. Sure. So, yeah, Andrew and, and for the audience, typically... Uh, from a venture capital industry perspective, what's been happening over the last uh, 10 to 15 years and, and for the last 30, 35 years in Silicon Valley uh, is that you know, uh, this institutional class of investors invests into companies using a typical uh, method called shareholders agreement or upfront allocation of equity or shares of your company. So if Andrew is the venture capitalist and he wants to invest in Shashank Randev, um, you know, typically Andrew will take a percentage of my company upfront uh, in lieu of the money uh, which is being offered. Now that is still applicable today, uh, but for later stage companies. Now, since the advent of the whole startup drive in Southeast Asia and in India, um, there are entrepreneurs who have just built out their minimal viable product or, or proof of concept possibly tested it out with a few companies and, and kind of broken their own bank balances to kind of build out their product. Um, they don't have a high burn rate and possibly require only a small uh, you know, set of capital. Now, these are companies which are likely not to be touched by growth stage venture capital funds because they haven't reached that scale. Now, what has been happening in this ecosystem that the failure rate of these companies, despite having a good product, um, you know, they've not been able to reach that or amplify their growth because they weren't able to raise that seed capital. So the problem uh, lies or was there in the ecosystem of seed capital or access to seed capital in the quickest manner. Now, you could, you could give smaller checks, but if you go the shareholders route or taking upfront equity, it's still a 60 to 90 day process in terms of, you know, getting the compliances in place, uh, getting the, um, uh, you know, getting the shareholders agreements in place and it takes a lot of work. Uh, in lieu of this, an ICF instrument is in essence in, by Indian law, a compulsory preference share, which essentially means that you take my money right now and I'll wire this money within 24 hours upon signing this agreement, subject to due diligence, technical due diligence and financial due diligence, which we go through, which shouldn't technically take more time at the stage we are investing in, because these companies are young, right? They're likely not to be, uh, you know, doing any hanky panky stuff. So, you know, due diligence should not take you more than nine, ten days. And so, we wire transfer the money very quickly, uh, and the agreement is signed off quickly, and they do not have to go through the process of allocating equity upfront. So, it helps them raise this small seed capital, which ranges between as low as thirty-five k, as high as one sixty k USD, and helps them accelerate their product development. Their, their GTM, and essentially their ability to kind of survive over the next 12 months and possibly go ahead and raise uh, possibly a pre-series A or series A round. This instrument is only applicable at this stage. Mm. It still doesn't hold uh, uh, at the growth stage, venture capital stage, because they, there you still need to have a valuation. This instrument prolongs the valuation because there is no inherent valuation at an early stage. You cannot possibly value a company which is a good deep tech company with zero customers, but you just can't say I'm valued at XX 
million because I have an IP. It doesn't work like that. You shouldn't work like that. And we're trying to change that mindset of founders that don't worry about the valuation at an early stage or when you're raising your first check. Focus on building the product, making it relevant for the market, getting some retention, getting some stickiness. And as a function of that, when you cross a threshold of your first fund raise, you are then are in a position to command a valuation. So that's the concept, Andrew, where we're just trying to quicken, fasten the process of fundraising at the uh, first level, their first check, where you not necessarily need to value your company and the capital required is small and it shouldn't take you more than you know, it shouldn't take you 60 days or 90 days to close that transaction. So that's mm. that's the that was the mission. That was the uh, the idea behind starting uh, Safe Instrument, and and it's a it's a tool which has been utilized in the valley for a very long time uh, by Y Combinator yep. and and so many words. We're trying to emulate the same model uh, in lieu of the legal terms applicable in India. Yep. And um, the benefit also is that you have a pretty standard contract. So you've already done a lot of work through iterations that you've just got a standard contract. The two parties come together and Correct. there's really no. And so I think the best, best thing over here, it doesn't really make sense to take a board seat, right? So we do not mm. take board seats. We, we don't have any rights per se uh, in the company. So let's say tomorrow, if I give my seat capital to a company and they do happen to kind of shut shop, uh, they're not liable to pay me upfront. You know, they'll have certain liabilities on the company side, but if it shuts down, I lose my money. And that's okay because the model over here is uh, to reduce the failure rate. So if I'm able to do 100 investments a year, I'm not worried about the ones which will fail and they're expected to give me my money back. I'm, mm. I, I'm excited about the opportunity of building out the 10 to 15 large unicorn companies. And then obviously the possibility of the remaining 30, 40 generating at least 20 X return, right? That's, that's what we're gunning after. Obviously there'll be failures, but we, we don't want to penalize them. And hence the, the contract essentially, as opposed to a standard shareholders agreement, doesn't have a board seat. We don't have any rights. Uh, and it's, it's more founder friend. Got it. Got it. And uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of something that I'm always challenged with as an, as a valuation guy uh, and in my valuation masterclass and in a lot of the valuation settings, People ask me, you know, can you value a company that doesn't even have revenue? And of course, the answer is, um, you know, truthfully, without revenue, it's all guessing. You know, anybody can make calculations, but without revenue, it's all guessing. So I have a DAR model, D-A-R. What I say is start first with the dream. We could value a dream. Now, it's guessing, but all valuation is guessing. It reminds me of a, I was listening to a guy talking uh, to Christopher Hitchens, a great speaker who was dying of cancer. And he kind of ap apologetically said to him, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm dying. And he said, but we all are. <laughs> so everything's a dream in a sense. So first of all, I say, you know, if you get five people in a room and you get a good idea, it's pretty exciting. You know, could you put a value on it? Could you get people to put money into it? What if one of the members in that room's name was Elon Musk? Would that bring value to that? So first thing is the dream. And we could make up a value. It could be $10. It could be a million dollars. But then the next thing is the A in D-A-R, and that is activity. Could you value a company on activity? Well, mm -hmm. look at the number of downloads or look at the number of customer acquisitions. Even if they're giving away the product for free, you could say, my goodness, we've got some information here sure. that we could use to try to value. And then the third item, which is R in the DAR model is just revenue. And if I was looking at, you know, if I gave advice about valuation to anybody about startup, which I don't need to give to you, but let's say to the audience, is that if you're investing in a company or if you're a company yourself, is that, you know, set your revenue projections on a month to month basis for three months ahead, let's say, and then every single month review those revenue numbers. And that really is the key focus. And as you grow those revenue numbers over time, you can, you can do evaluation off of revenue. Of course, people want to value off of cash flow and profit and all that stuff. But that's my, the way I look at it is the dream, the activity and the revenue. 
But what I see about this, this iSafe note is that it postpones that process. You don't have to go through a makeup process of, oh, this is worth X, Y, Z, when really nobody knows. So you're postponing it. One, one question about it that I have too is that when an event happens in the future, how is the valuation determined or is it that you're a percentage holder in whatever valuation comes? Sure. So it, it comes in with a valuation cap and a discount um, and obviously subject to how the company has performed and based on that, how, how they've managed to successfully raise around. But I mean, most of our portfolio companies, they've gone ahead and raised a price round, uh, which is the shareholders round where we've seen funds like Sequoia, um, Chirate Ventures, which is a very prominent fund in India, come in and obviously, as I mentioned, came in at a certain valuation and uh, came in um, with a shareholders agreement. There were also companies which had still not matured enough for a growth stage BC round. And, and they went on to raise another round through a bunch of angels, through to super HNIs or smaller family offices through the SQL safe note, which again helped them uh, you know, uh, not get a valuation upfront. Again, came in at a valuation cap and a discount. Uh, and help them raise, let's say, 250K to 350K USD, uh, which accelerated, let's say, their customer acquisition or, or pushing their uh, pushing out uh, their GTM to a larger set of clients, maybe international geography, and thereby increasing their month-on-month -month growth uh, and becoming more relevant for a price round. So, so that that's how it's it it pans out. Uh, in many cases, you know, we've seen the companies be affected by the COVID situation. But there's been a tremendous, tremendous surge in the way certain sectors have risen. Like, for instance, SaaS as a segment, right? Uh, and they've just, they've just grown month on month. And, and some certain companies in the consumer package goods obviously were, uh, you know, suffered um, because of, you know, the, the lack of distribution during COVID months. But they, they came back through online uh, e-commerce channels. And, and, and hence, they were able to kind of uh, raise money either through SQL Safe Note or or reach out to institutional investors. Uh, but that's that's the beauty of this instrument. Again, I, I reiterate the point that in India and also in, in this whole developing uh, economy countries, which we are part of uh, Thailand, Philippines, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Middle East, there we, we are unlike the Silicon Valley. We are at least 25 years away from what's been happening in Silicon Valley. We cannot peg ourselves. Uh, the, it, to give you an example, Andrew, you know what we call seed round in India is much different than a seed round in US. You know, a seed round in US can be 1.5 mil. In, in in India, that's that's like almost your Series A, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 nomenclature doesn't matter over here. What matters is that uh, uh, the the ecosystem is very very fragile, and uh, it's a funk. Your your Series B transactions or your your growth stage venture capital industry will only pick up if there's a supply of sustainable deals and and that ecosystem needs to be uh, uh flourishing and if you've got a massive failure rate due to bureaucracy of you know evaluation process which has been there and it's still applicable at growth stage but not necessarily at the early stage then it kind of kills the momentum mm -hmm. and, and i think the whole safe note concept in silicon valley accelerated that process now today why combinator is the place a mecca for all vcs to come in scout for opportunities so yeah. that's 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 the whole. Uh, it's just the place in the, the pyramid structure yeah. where where today for the first time India has a bunch of startups, um, and and some of them are likely to fail and failing because they're not able to raise this capital. So that yeah. that's the background behind. Got it. it. Well, <clears throat> I I appreciate that. There's a lot to learn, so that's pretty cool. So now, it's time to share your worst investment ever, and since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be. Tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and tell us your story. Sure, sure. So, you know, I mean, uh, we, we launched this fund only a year and a half ago. We've done 39 investments. Uh, we are yet to see an exit. Uh, so it's fairly early for us to say that, which is our worst investment uh, from a fund perspective. On my personal angel investment portfolio size, side, I, I've done four odd investments since March, uh, since May, 2018. And even there, it's quite early on to say, uh, you know, which has been my, uh, you know, worst investment because I'm, I'm a fairly new investor. But I, I, I can be, I have 
I have one investment which I regret because which was my which became my anti portfolio, and, and I missed out on that. And and that's what I like to talk about. And and more so because you know it, it's a great ecosystem to be an aspiring angel investor. And and this 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 is this experience for those of us uh, in the ecosystem who want to experiment with this asset class. And, and, and when I started out, you know, I had certain uh, notions about evaluating a company and, and in, in that process, I lost out on a big opportunity. So I'd like to touch upon that today. Uh, yep. and, and in hindsight, you know, it was a massive learning for me, for me, which is really helping me now today at 100X to kind of evaluate companies. So, so Andrew, this, this is a story from, you know, um, uh, you know August, 2018, uh, not much time, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'd recently started evaluating companies uh, from a personal investment perspective, right? And, uh, and, and, you know, so, I mean, prior to becoming an investor, since I was the founding member for VCC Edge, where I monitored and analyzed early stage startups in India. So that really helped me develop research skills for you know mapping comparable startups across sectors so while you know there are multiple metrics a venture fund evaluates before deciding to invest typically angel investors you know will largely go by their passion or gut and you know if they really like the founder and and at an early stage the angel investors judgment call is based on the founding team um, their pedigree and, and hope that the market size will continue to you know exist in the years to come. So for me, uh, you know, conversation in commerce was and still continues to be a market to, uh, to go after, and particularly in India where vernacular uh, is a huge opportunity. Mm. So there was this company which I was evaluating, uh, it's called buzo.ai, B-U-Z-Z-O.ai, um, uh, you know, which was meeting this criteria of, you know, solving a problem in vernacular conversational AI. I first met these founders in 2017 um, and decided to lead the investment through an angel network uh, in August of 2018. Uh, and the founders, you know, both with excellent pedigree, uh, came from IIT Bombay, a very, very reputed, uh, you know, uh, technical institute in India, uh, where, you know, and they were building this conversational artificial intelligence assistant for retailers. Uh, and they had previously, you know, exited a successful startups. So they were second time founders, which was a huge tick mark for me. Uh, that company was acquired by a very large company called Nokri.com, very prominent in India in 2013. So they had all the right ingredients. Um, and they were, they were building out this AI assistant that would understand a customer's need through natural conversation, uh, offering relevant recommendations and explaining why that maybe the best choice huge opportunity extremely exciting and i drove I, you know i drove into it and how angel networks work is since i was part of it i was leading this transaction so I, my job was to convince all the other angel net investors in that network that i'm putting in let's say uh, 10 baht or, or 100 baht in this company and you know why don't you guys come in and chip in 50 50 and let's raise a raj around and this company's going to do well so i was advocating for this transaction mm. now during this process uh, obviously, even in an angel network, the transactions take time. Once you've got a larger sum raised and you're leading the transaction, you put in your own money. By the time the paperwork gets done, it takes you roughly uh, three, three and a half months. Uh, and during this process, uh, you know, uh, I kept on telling them, you know, you guys have just rolled this out and this is a proof of concept or a, or a minimal viable product, so to speak. Uh, can you go out and try implementing this in certain companies and, and I want to see something tangible. Um, and, and they wanted to focus on enhancing their algorithms for specific categories. So I, along with other angels, wanted them to kind of work on the proof of concept. Somehow at the end of 2018, uh, you know, after spending five months or multiple conversation, I wasn't convinced that they would be able to sell. What was coming, what was becoming uh, prevalent during the conversations was that, you know, they are, they're spending too much time building out the product and they're not going out selling. Uh, either it's a challenge in terms of doing BD or, or maybe the product is not fully built out. I, I wasn't worried about the product not being fully built out because they had the technical know-how, they'd built a company earlier, which got acquired. And uh, so I was more concerned about uh, they not being able to roll out a proof of concept with any company. And literally by any, I mean zero. 
So, so you know, and, and hence I, I was. I, I can was imagine busy. the frustration because yeah, you're looking I, at they're smart, they're, yeah. but they just keep digging deeper into making the product better. Correct. Correct. So, so I was disappointed. Um, I was really disappointed because I'd, I'd known them for some time and I was, I was, I was advocating for them in this angel network. And, and, and eventually I decided that, you know, it doesn't make sense. I have other deals to look at. I have my, my, you know, my relationship with other angels in the network. I don't want to jeopardize that. You know, they'll know, they won't trust me for whatever deal I advocate for. So it's not worth it. Um, I'm pulling the plug. I don't want to lead this deal. And I decided not to lead the round. And eventually that company did not get funded by the angel network. Mm-hmm. Um, come September, 2019, literally a year after, or less than a year, maybe 10 months down the line, um, uh, you know, they were acquired by uh, a company called Haptic, which is a Reliance-backed company. And Reliance is a huge, huge company mm. in India. Um, and, and, they, and they got acquired for their technology uh, to leverage its, you know, they wanted to leverage its platform to power multilingual experiences for the next 500 million Indians that will come online to shop with zero customers. Uh, and, and, and because they built a hardcore tech product. And, and <laughs> when I saw that news come out, uh, and I, I think I lost out. If I would have invested, I would have easily made within those ten months due to that exit cycle or acquisition cycle. I would have easily made a seven x return wow. on whatever, whatever capital I would have invested in. So, uh, and I clearly missed that out because of I don't know, and I still don't know. When I look back on the transaction, you know, uh, I mean, there's there's just so many so many learnings. Well, let's that. let's go through like yeah. what? How would you summarize what you learned from that? I'm still learning to be very candid. You know, I'm still learning as to how to interpret that one situation. There's no, there's no, I don't have a fixed answer. Uh, what I, the only answer I have is that I, I cannot possibly have one, one set of perspective when looking at a very early stage company um, uh, because anything can happen. Acquisition can happen out of 10X valuation within 10 months uh, or, you know, uh, you know, they might just get funded for, uh, which has happened in one of our portfolio companies right now, where we invested in a deep tech company with zero revenues, super product. Uh, within three months, they got funded at a valuation. If this was a valuation round, uh, which which was obscene. Um, and uh, and and therein was the lesson for me. So what my my learnings from this missed opportunity were multifold. You know, so while it's important. For, for a deep technology company to sell their solution or any company to sell this uh, solution. The reason why Boozo.ai got acquired was because they had managed to build a moat around their core product technology. Mm-hmm. And, and while if they would have continued, and I realized that they have a mindset that they want to sell this or you know, get the company or the product required. So it was a perfect roadmap. And I was of the mindset that they should stand alone and go out and roll out the product. And from that vantage point, obviously uh, they could have never scaled because their mindset was to sell it to another large company, which, it, which is exactly what they did. Uh, and they built it out around that uh, space where you know, a large company came in, they really felt that this product will fit into their larger scheme of events and strategy. And, and they went ahead and acquired it. So, so what I realized is, you know, it's important to sell, sure, but what is more important is if you can build around a moat uh, around the core product with or without POCs, and that's still debatable. I keep mm. keep keep debating that, and it, it's it depends on each company to each company. This is not a standard uh, learning for across companies across sectors. Yep. But for a deep technology company with or without POCs, uh, if you focus on the product, then uh, that still remains critical to be a, to have a differentiated offering, and, and that's my learning. Mm. But again. The learning continues, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. This, this, that's what this, makes it so fun. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so that's, that's been my journey in terms got of it. The, the company which I missed out on totally. Okay, so let me summarize a few things that I took away from this. The first thing is that uh, I have a factory in Thailand. It's a coffee mm-hmm. factory. And mm-hmm. my best friend Dale runs that. And he runs mm-hmm. it very well. And we're equal shareholders in the company. And um, we had a, a, a coffee company from Europe come said that they wanted to see us. And so the owner of that company came and did a tour of our factory. Mm. And we went out to dinner that night and he looked at us and he said, you know, I don't normally do this, but uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm ready. I would buy, I'm making an offer for your company right now at this table for, you know, three times revenue, whatever that was. And <clears throat> it blew us away, you know, but what, what, one of the things that we learned about that, and we decided not to take the, the offer because we just saw so much growth that we could capture ourselves. But what I, what you realize is that the, the reasons for acquiring often have nothing to do with the objectives of the existing owners. Yep. You know, he, he, he didn't care if we had profit or loss or what, it didn't matter. Mm. He wanted a foothold. He wanted a distribution channel. He wanted to put his brands through it. And that's why sometimes people say, well, you know, we want to make a profit before we sell. Mm. Not necessary. Many Mm. companies don't care at all about that. So that's a little story that I share that has some relationship with it. Um, the other thing is that, uh, is that I would say, I oftentimes say that one of the best ways to start up a company is to determine who your buyer is going to be. Mm-hmm. And one of the best companies that I've been involved with and was involved with selling this startup, and we sold the company to a, they had been planning for 16 years who was going to buy their company. They knew it. Every time they went out to a trade show, they went directly to that company to show them how that what they're doing with their product. But of course, that company didn't know. But these guys knew. And I think it's a really big challenge for everyone out there is try to identify who's going to buy you. And that company was Microsoft. And I was the, the, the guy that did the deal on the financial side. And yeah. it was you know fantastic. But because they had set their sights on it, they had set up so many things that made it you know, so that they could do that. And so, you know, uh, finally, I would say I'm reminded of a, a quote, if there is such a thing as a quote from Buddha, and that is, there are many paths to enlightenment. Try every path. And that's the same thing in startup world. You know, there yeah. are no rules. You know, if yeah. you go in and you say, you've got to get revenue right from the beginning. Yeah, that may work for some, but yeah. not for others. Yeah. And another one, you say, you've got to focus on your technology, your mode, as you said. Yeah, yeah, that may work, but that just may be absolutely destructive. So it's that, it's that mix of the founders, the technology, the industry, yeah. the VC, they all come together. Yeah. It's really unpredictable. Ultimately, right. you know, it's just very, very hard to predict. And that, I believe, is what makes your type of business and investing so exciting because you're trying to spot what is that thing? And the better you get, the more you realize that you really can't spot it. <clears throat> it's yeah. really hard to spot. And anybody that thinks that they can, you know, will find that they're wrong, you know, at least sometimes. So those are yeah. some of the things I take away. Anything you'd add to that? No, I, I think I agree with you, Andrew. And it's a very, very difficult spot to be in. And a lot of the time VCs are asked, you know, what do you think the next five years trends are? And, you know, honestly, my answer to that is, you know, I need to speak with five founders to give you a sense of what the trend is, because you know those are the guys who are building the next uh, market or the next next disruptive product. We guys are only investing in them and figuring mm-hmm. out how we can expand the market. So, so, so it is it is a difficult place to be in. But uh, on a personal note, I'm super super excited <clears throat> about the way the whole uh, opportunity is coming alive in 2021 for Southeast Asia and mm-hmm. India. Uh, we've got data penetration for the first time at the highest. And, and we've got customers who are, you know, uh, well aware of their mother tongue as well as, you know, the English language, right? Uh, and, you know, you've stayed in Thailand. We both yeah. of us have stayed in Thailand. It's just amazing to see the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the lack of linguistic challenges which we face or we mm. face. I think it's, it's, it's as comfortable as you possibly staying in, let's say, U.S. because, you know, it's a, it's a lot more convenient folks being surrounded by you, surrounded uh, folks surrounding you who can speak English, right? Mm. So the vernacular play also is panning out wherein, you know, they are still, their ability to kind of pick up an e-commerce portal, which can help them order in their local Thai language, or let's say in India, in Hindi, uh, despite the fact they are, they, they're well uh, versed with English, but it, it still gives them their added, so that market is picking up, right? The whole, the whole uh, smaller for smaller medium businesses who are now becoming more automated are coming on 
the digital landscape for the first time are getting visibility all this is happening right now and and mm. i just feel it's a great time not only startups but you know small medium enterprises who've been doing legacy businesses for the last 20 years let's say just making plastics in a small manufacturing plant for the first time they have the opportunity to go digital and push their business out in you know various other cities and 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 geographies so it's it's just a fantastic time to be building it's the next industrial revolution in my mind yeah across across geography and and really boils down to how much we can pull up our sleeves and you know and kind of just start working okay so my next question before i ask it i'm going to set it up by saying imagine a young man or woman and they have started to build a career in vc there in the beginning of their career and you now have some experience that you can really give them some advice so and i'm going to challenge you i'm going to ask you for one thing based on what you learn from this story and what you continue to learn what one action one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate you know I, it's, it's a little counterintuitive i would want them to make their mistakes because if they don't make the mistakes early on they're likely to make a very expensive mistake later on which will cost the venture capital fund so so from that perspective i think they will need to make their mistakes what would be interesting is yes uh, and and they should be firm about their thought process so let's say they're evaluating a deal and if they fundamentally believe for whatever reason let's say you know i used to go uh, if if that analyst used to go um, to you know uh, uh, let's say a state board school in thailand as an example mm. right and and they they evaluating an auto grading tool and and they they like this is this doesn't make sense man nobody's going to use an auto grading tool in this type of school this is my bias but i want to stick with my bias i would say stick with your bias because you if you believe in yourself and you believe in that idea no matter if you're wrong make that mistake and move on because if you believe that no what is your fund manager going to think about your decision your thought process and 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 they end up investing on your behalf which might not be the right investment could be a good one too but might not be they you'll end up making a lot of costly mistakes right mm. uh, or rather you'll end up making one costly mistake down the line so make those mistakes i think those i mean okay. it's a business of making mistakes you make 10 mistakes and you make one win and you you'll have the learning in that so a lot of failures needs to come my objective <laughs> is that don't treat venture capital business as um as as something which uh is easy or or is something which is like uh you need to spend time with the founders you need to believe in the vision yep. and it's more important you and it's human psychology right so you cannot possibly uh determine how the founder will behave five years down the line if let's say there's a there's a personal emergency or personal mm. um uh you know episode in the in the founder's life it's, you just don't know so make then you fo- get yeah, to know so the you, founder yeah get to know the founder but then also focus on the business so how do you think the business will grow or the product will grow uh all of those things but again m- make those mistakes stand by what you believe in even if it's wrong don't mm-hmm. be don't be shy about you know your personal opinion when when expressing about a deal because those those personal uh, nuances make a lot of difference right You know, the other day I was walking down the street in Bangkok and you know what the sidewalks in Bangkok were like. Yeah. And I felt It's been a while though. It's been 20 yeah, years so I don't def- know now. It's definitely it's definitely a lot better. But yeah. on this day I fell and I got tripped, you know, by stuff on the ground and and then, you know, at 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 my age as I get older, you know, and I look at taking care of my mom and you know, falls are very dangerous. Yeah. and i i pulled out of it and you know with little minor this or that and i thought to myself i'm glad i know how to fall yeah, yeah you know and one of the things that we learn is that by falling many times as a kid where yeah. you know there's no supervision when i was yeah. you know there's nothing like what kids get yeah. these days we just went out in the woods and we fell out of trees and we fell yeah. walking and running but the point is is that by doing that we learn how to roll we learn how to Absolutely. not you know hurt ourselves in different ways and the result of that is that we carry that knowledge into Absolutely. our you know into our age and i've now come to believe really that actually one of the most important things to be successful in life is risk reduction and a great way to think of that is maybe let's just think about basketball as an example you know there's there's basketball teams in the us you know and there's top level 
professionals, but it's a small number, yeah. you know, 3,000, whatever that number is. Right. But truthfully, there's probably another 10, 100,000 that could be on that court. Now, they may have decided that it just wasn't worth it for them, but there's ones that really wanted to be on that court. And the only difference is they got injured. Yeah. They hurt their knee, they hurt their elbow, they hurt their shoulder, and they could not perform to the level that they wanted to perform. And so what I like to think about is, you know, experiencing risk as you've advised and growing from that, but also reducing it. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? So, Andrew, my number one goal is to ensure that we reach a portfolio size of 100 uh, at 100x.vc. Um, and that's, that's the objective. We are at a portfolio size of 39 and hopefully by April end at a portfolio size of 50. And that gives us roughly seven odd months uh, to kind of uh, invest in 60 more companies. And, and, and that's very critical. And that's my ambition right now, uh, because once we've done that, that's when we'll be genuinely solving the problem of you know, the seed stage capital, uh, more number of companies, uh, less number of failures, successes. So, so that's the ultimate goal. Fantastic. Uh, for the next 12 months. I am sure you're going to get there. Well, <laughs> listeners. Thanks. Yep. There you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. By the way, my number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, to reduce risk in your life. So go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and download the risk reduction checklist and see how you measure up. As we conclude, Shashank, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate this. And I, I genuinely enjoyed being on the show. I'm looking forward to meeting you soon and, and you know, uh, doing this again. And my, my parting words is you know, for the audience who are aspiring to become A, um, angel investors and B entrepreneurs um, don't think too much just go ahead and try it out whatever you want to do beautiful and in Thai language we say ya kid ma yeah. meaning don't think too much yeah. and that's a wrap on another great story to help us create grow and most importantly protect our well fellow risk takers this is your worst podcast host Andrew Stott saying I'll see you on the upside